that I did. Yes. <laughs> okay, we're ready. We're ready? Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Dr. René Vidal. So Professor Vidal received, received his B.S. degree in electrical engineering with highest honors from the Pon uh, Pontificia University Católica de Chile in 1997 and his MS and PhD degrees in electrical engineering and computer sciences from the University of California at Berkeley in 2000 and 2003, respectively. He's currently an associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering and the Center for Imaging Science of the John Hopkins University since 2004. Dr. Vidal was co-editor with Anders Hayden and Yima of the book Dynamical Vision and has co-authored more than 150 articles in biomedical image analysis, computer vision, machine learning, hybrid systems, and robotics. Dr. Vidal is associate director of the IEEE Transactions on Pattern Analysis and Machine Intelligence, PAMI, and the SIAM Journal on Imaging Sciences and the Journal of Mathematical Imaging and Vision. He was or will be program chair for ICCV 2015, CVPR 2014, WMVC 2009, PSI VT 2007. He was or will be area chair for CBPR 2013, ICCV 2011, ICCV 2007, and CBPR 2005. Dr. Vidal is recipient of numerous awards for, for his work, including the 2011 Best Paper Award finalist with Roberto Tron and Vijan Afsari at the Conference on Decision and Control, the 2009 ONR Young Investigator Award, the 2009 Sloan Research Fellowship, the 2005 NSF Career Award, and the 2004 Best Paper Award uh, Honorable Mention with Professor Yima. At the European Conference on Computer Vision, he also received the 2004 Sacrisson um, Memorial Prize for completing an uh, exceptional uh, document piece of research the 2003 Eli Jury Award for Outstanding Achievement in the Areas of Systems, Communications, Controls, or Signal Processing, the 2002 Student Con uh, Continuation Award from um, uh, NASA Ames, the 1998 Marcos Orrego Palma Award from the Institute of Engineers of Chile, and the 1997 Award of the School of Engineering of the Pontificia University, Universidad Católica de Chile to the best graduating student of the school. He's a member of the IEEE and the ACM. So please, um, let us welcome Rene Vida. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a real, real pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks to Edgar for inviting me and organizing the trip. I've had a wonderful time this morning, and uh, I'm, en I'm enjoying my visit very much. So before getting to the main subject, of the talk, I thought I'll give a little bit of an overview of several of the things that my students have been currently working and the kinds of things that I've done over the past several years. So I did my PhD at Berkeley, uh, as Edgar did, and uh, at that time I was very interested in robotics. So one of the first things I worked on was uh, this idea of having a helicopter that's flying and trying to land a helicopter on a moving platform. Uh, the idea was to be able to do this uh, not just from typical inertial sensors such as a GPS or an INS, but really try to do this from cameras. Uh, basically, there was this landing target that was moving. You would use basic image processing techniques to be able to extract a set of features in the target. You can think of these as the corners of the square that you're looking at right now. Track those in time and use uh, those point trajectories in the image to be able to figure out the relative orientation of the helicopter relative to the moving target. And once you're able to estimate that relative orientation and position, you can use that for control purposes for, for the tasks of landing the helicopter. Uh, next, we became interested in having multiple robots. So in this uh, particular video, what you're seeing is a game between two teams. Uh, well, unfortunately, they're all red, so there is no red team and blue team, but uh, there should be. So there is a team of pursuers and there is a team of evaders. And what you're trying to do is to uh, develop distributed control strategies to send the pursuer team in such a way that you can capture the team of evaders. And you want to prove things about it, such as can I capture it with probability one? 
or can I capture with an expected time of capture that is not infinite and things like that. So the way you do that is by gathering data from lots of sensors, cameras and uh, GPS and things of the like. You build probabilistic maps where at every location what you want to do is to compute the probability of having a target or an evader. And then you design control strategies that send the pursuers so that they can catch the evaders with the probabilistic guarantees that I talked about earlier. So at that time, we were doing it basically from sensors such as GPS, sonars, that allow you to compute local information. But from cameras, it wasn't there. Namely, the first problem that I talked about, landing a helicopter and estimating relative geometry posed from a single moving object, that was doable with techniques of the time. And we were able to actually do it in real time. But this idea of tracking and segmenting several moving objects wasn't there at the time. So part of my thesis was precisely to figure out techniques for solving this problem, which is given videos that have several objects that are moving, how do you go about separating the trajectories? Uh, which ones correspond to robot one, which ones correspond to robot two, and so on and so forth. And that's called structure from motion, uh, multi-body structure from motion, or motion segmentation. And quickly, uh, not maybe not so quickly, it took me some time, uh, I figured out that one can convert these dynamical segmentation problems uh, that come from videos to more geometric uh, and machine learning type of problems, such as the one I'm illustrating here with this picture, where you have a cloud of points, really, that lives in a high dimensional space, and it lives in unions of subspaces. And subspace number one might correspond to all the trajectories that are associated with the car that it's moving, while subspace number two might be associated with all the trajectories of points that are in the background. And therefore, the problem of segmenting uh, videos that have several moving objects is rendered to be equivalent to the problem of clustering high dimensional data in unions of subspaces. And uh, my PhD work was to develop a technique coming from algebraic geometry that is able to solve this problem uh, in, in close form. The key idea being that uh, you can feed polynomials to the data, and by factorizing them, you get the segmentation. So then I moved to Hopkins, uh, and these are some of the great students that I've had the possibility to, to work with. Uh, the ones on the left have already graduated, and the ones on the right are uh, still in the lab. And they work in a number of areas, not only in computer vision, which is maybe the core of the lab, but also in related areas, uh, as, as Edgar mentioned earlier. So just to give you a few examples, in computer vision, we are not only looking at the motion segmentation problem that I already motivated, but we're also looking at uh, non-rigid motions in the scene. You can think of the, the forming motion of water, the, uh, having trees that are moving with the wind. Uh, uh, you can think of fire. Uh, things that are very non-rigid and deformable. So how do you model them? How do you recognize them? How do you classify them? Uh, we are looking at people. People is sort of in between. Here you have rigid objects. They are non-rigid. People are articulated. Uh, so how do you model them? How do you recognize them? How do you model? More generally, how do you model time series data? And how do you develop techniques for classifying them? Uh, we have been working also with networks of cameras and trying to look at distributed techniques for taking traditional centralized computer vision algorithms and making them distribute them uh, with the idea that you can have maybe a sensor network where every node of the network uh, is uh, equipped with a camera. And that leads to distributed optimization. But because these problems have a lot of geometry, uh, it's optimi distributed optimization on manifold. Um, so I already mentioned a little bit of this. Uh, we're also working uh, lots of things in medical imaging. So one specific example that I'm showing there, that's uh, an image of the brain. And what that has is a collection of fibers, fibers that connect different regions of the brain. So how can you extract those? You can look at images that are called diffusion uh, that try to measure what is the local orientation uh, in the brain. And then by just following the local orientation, you're going to extract these fibers. And once you have these fibers, you can look at uh, are the fibers similar or different in a normal population versus someone that has a neurological disease, such as Alzheimer's disease. Um, this project over here, actually let me, let me maybe tell you a little bit more about that. It's called the language of surgery. Um, how many of you have ever had a surgery before? Did you ever ask yourself how skillful the doctor was? 
want to worry about it. <laughs> he didn't want to worry about it. <laughs> so, um, interestingly <coughs> enough, right, if we think about things that we do as humans that require some level of skill, we were talking about soccer at lunchtime, right? So, um, that requires some talent. Uh, so, you would imagine that being a surgeon also requires some talent. So, you would imagine that there is a way to measure how, talent, uh, how much talent you have, how skillful you are. And so, the way you do that is in the medical school, you just practice. Uh, so, the, the basic premise is uh, do one, see one, and teach one. Uh, and so, that's the way you learn how to do surgery. Uh, but interestingly enough, the way in which uh, students are evaluated at the end of the day is really how long they've practiced, not really how skillful they are. And so, I've always think that no matter how much I practice soccer, I would never be Leo Messi. So, there needs to be maybe a quantitative way of assessing the level of skill. So, how can we do that? Uh, today, that's possible because some type of surgeries are actually done with robots. There is a robot called Da Vinci. Uh, and here you can see uh, this is a surgeon. There is a console here. He has access to stereoscopic vision. He manipulates the robot. And on the other end, this is where the robot is, and here is where the patient is supposed to be. So, now you have cameras. You can actually insert tools into the patient, and uh, you can do surgery with that. And in fact, this is done today routinely uh, and has a lot of advantages. The recovery time is faster. The, uh, the size of the incisions that are made in the body is typically smaller, and so on and so forth. So, unfortunately, it takes longer to learn how to do surgery with a robot than doing it directly. And in fact, evaluating it, whether you're doing it well or bad, is easier if you're actually looking at the hands of the person doing it versus looking at how the robot is moving. So, uh, on the other hand, because we're using robots, uh, now you have time series data. You can actually look at the trajectories as a function of time. You can look at the video and you can see what's going on. So, the fundamental question is, can I take the data that is, uh, suppose that I did have a training set. I had 10 surgeons that, you know, have just practiced for a week, and so they're very likely not very good. And I had another set of people that have done it for 10 years, so they're probably experts. So I can actually have training examples of what a skillful surgeon looks like and what a novice looks like. And now I can try to use machine learning techniques to try to learn models of expertise that I can then use to actually determine in a more automatic fashion whether a surgeon has acquired a certain level of skill. If I were able to do that, presumably I could use this for teaching. I could just, if someone is learning and has been practicing for a week, I could actually give him a grade as to how well he's doing. Or more precisely, if I have the ability uh, to not only have one label for the entire video, but several labels for different pieces, then I could actually tell him, you screwed up in this part. So that's the basic idea of a language, because I'm speaking, I am saying sentences, the sentences are divided in words, and the words are divided into phonemes. And the way in which I transition from phoneme to phoneme is according to the grammar of English. Same thing in surgery. You have a uh, surgical procedure is divided into tasks. Tasks are divided into basic units of human motion, so if I'm suturing, I'm grabbing the needle, I insert it, I pull it up on the other side, and I keep going. So we call those basic units of human motion surgenes in the analogy to phonemes. And the grammar is, well, how do I transition? Uh, in the same way that English uh, decides how do I transition from phoneme to phoneme, uh, there, there we hypothesize there is a language associated with surgery. Think, for instance, I need to grab the needle before I insert it. So there is a logical thing that I need to capture. So the mathematics of it is that I need to take this time series data, I need to segment it in time according to each one of these surgenes, then I need to look at the transitions from surgenes to surgenes to determine the level of skill. Let me give you one concrete example. If I'm an, a novice, presumably I'll grab the needle, I'll insert it, I'll try to pull it out on the other side, if it didn't come out well, I'll go back. So if I just look at the state transitions from surgene to surgene, there will be additional transitions relative to an expert that will probably just grab the needle, insert it, and keep going. So typically, and we observe that in real data, the transitions are much cleaner uh, on experts than they are on novices. The second thing we observe and that we hypothesize is that skill also has to do with the continuous dynamics, namely how well you ex execute a particular gesture. 
And so we're trying to develop models that are able to capture and compare time series, both the discrete transitions as well as the continuous dynamics. Um, how do we do all of this? Uh, there are lots of techniques that come from machine learning. One of them that I already mentioned, and that's the topic of my talk today, is this idea of clustering data according to unions of subspaces. That shows up in the motion segmentation example I already gave. It will show up in examples that I'm going to mention later about clustering faces. The faces of a human also correspond to one subspace. You could think of the sergemes that I was talking about. They also live in low rank subspaces. And the transition from one sergeme to another is equivalent to going from one subspace to another subspace. Uh, and that is where the techniques that come out of sparsity rank minimization are currently playing a, a great role on how to model high dimensional data with low dimensional subspaces, either linear subspaces or nonlinear manifolds, as I'm illustrating here on the right. Um, the second aspect of the research is really this idea of comparing dynamics and comparing how well you execute things. And we, in general, model things with linear dynamical systems. So you could think of every chunk of a video as a dynamical model. You could think of a small piece of a of a sergeme, as I would say, as a dynamical model. And so you can ask the question, if this is the video at time t, and it comes uh, out of the evolution of this dynamical system, now I have two dynamical systems. How do I compare them? And so we have been able to figure out how, by comparing the parameters of the dynamical model, you can as effectively assess a distance between videos. So going back to the examples that I've talked about so far, how far are two executions of a sergeme from two different doctors. It can be computed, for instance, with the distances between the dynamical models of the two. The same thing for comparing a video of walking versus a video of running, or a video of fire versus a video of water. And so developing these distances is important. Unfortunately, is the mathematics is non-trivial. There is a lot of quotient spaces and Riemannian geometry that goes into it combined with dynamical models. All right? Um, let me now then, with that introduction, move to the main topic of the talk, which is uh, this idea of sparsity classification. Right? So we live in an, an era of data deluge. There is way more data every day uh, than we can possibly uh, imagine and process. And that's coming out of uh, not only vision and images, as I've, as I've talked so far, but also bioinformatics, information retrieval, Google, and so on and so forth. So we need methods to analyze the data. Uh, and the only way to, well, not necessarily the only way, but I believe that uh, figuring out that different classes correspond to low dimensional structures is important to be able to do that. The example of faces is one of them that I like. Faces, if you take the images of faces, suppose that the pose of the person is not changing. And all you do is that you just change the light. Uh, and you look now at the space of all images of that single person, that lives in a three-dimensional subspace. Three-dimensional because you just have the dot product between the direction of the light and the normal to the surface. Uh, so if I now have images of lots of different people under different illumination conditions, each one of them will be a subspace. Uh, the same thing about videos that I've already argued. This is from the previous presidential election where you had debates between Hillary and Obama. So now you have videos that can be decomposed in several video clips. You can model each piece of the video as a low rank structure, and therefore you have different subspaces. And the motion segmentation problem that I've already mentioned, uh, it's also a problem that involves union of subspaces, one per moving object. So there are two fundamental tasks. One is clustering. I just want to get these videos and separate it into multiple groups, but I don't know, I don't have a semantic meaning for each group. And the second one is classification, where I want to not only separate it into multiple groups, but I want to assign a semantic label to each group, like fire versus water, or inserting the needle versus grabbing the needle. So what I hope to convey, and the key message of this talk, is that techniques uh, that, uh, from sparsity uh, can be very useful for both the clustering and segmentation problem. Uh, for tasks that have to do with multiple subspaces, multiple manifolds. If you are familiar with the area of sparsity, uh, most of it is 
related to just a single linear equation. Um, and what we have done here is to look at how we can extend that to unions of subspaces. And in the case of clustering, uh, unions of subspaces where you don't know the membership, which data points come from which group. So how do we do that? So over the last few years, and this is mostly work, by the way, by my student, Esan El Hamifar, uh, we have developed this technique called sparse subspace clustering, which I'm going to explain what I mean by that. So mathematically, what do we want to do? We're given a cloud of points. It is drawn from a union of subspaces. And you want to find the, how many subspaces there are, what are their dimensions. They could be different from each other. A basis for every subspace and the segmentation of the data. In general, this is sort of a chicken and egg problem. If I knew the segmentation, I could fit a subspace to every group by doing standard principal component analysis. If I uh, knew a basis for every subspace, I could just compute the distance from every point to every group and assign every point to the closest subspace. But I know neither, so the traditional approach is to iterate. Now, the problem is complicated by a number of things. The data, in general, is contaminated by noise. Uh, there will be uh, missing entries. So if you think about these moving objects, right, there will be occlusion. So eventually, a trajectory will disappear, and it will be not complete from then on. Uh, there are outliers. Uh, the, tr the tracker could make a mistake and start tracking a completely wrong piece of the video. That also happens. So how do you deal with those situations? So the first type of methods uh, that were developed for this problem naturally iterated between one or the other. But that imposes lots of restrictions. It imposes restrictions such as all subspaces need to have the same dimensions, uh, or I need to know the dimensions beforehand. Uh, and the other uh, big disadvantage of those methods is that they require good initialization. Namely, because you're doing alternating minimization, there are non-convex type of problems, initialization is critical. And that's true not only of iterative methods, such as generalizations of k-means, such as k-subspaces, but also of the probabilistic approaches that are based on um, expectation maximization type of approaches. So, the goal of that algebraic geometric approach that I mentioned earlier, called generalized PCA, was to figure out, are there ways of solving this problem in close form? Uh, what are the conditions, and how do we do that? Uh, and those methods were great when there is no noise and when the data is perfect. In fact, we showed that the problem can be solved in close form up to four subspaces. And you can get everything, the dimension of the subspaces, and the number, and so on and so forth. But it doesn't work well with data that is contaminated. So the quest has been, how do we get methods that really work uh, in real? And the family of methods that have really uh, made a difference over the last five years are methods based on spectral clustering. And so I'm going to talk in more detail about those, because uh, in fact, the method I'm going to propose belongs to this last family. And if you're interested, uh, I, I had a tutorial last year in the Signal Processing Magazine uh, that describes many of these methods in a great detail. So spectral clustering. How many of you have ever heard of spectral clustering before? All right, so a good third of you. So the basic idea of spectral clustering is the following. I have a set of points, and I want to separate them into multiple groups. How am I going to do that? Uh, I am going to construct a similarity. I'm going to construct a graph, first of all. Every uh, data point is a node. And then I'm going to connect pairs of points. How? According to some similarity. And this is what is defined here as Cij. So typically, what might be a good similarity? Well, you can think of the distance and e to the minus the distance. So e to the minus the distance is going to be, you know, if two points are very, very close, the distance is nearly 0, e to 0 is 1. So similarity is nearly 1 if points are in the same group. They are nearly 0 if they are in different groups. That's the basic idea. So e to the minus the distance typically does the job. And without getting into the details, and this part is a little bit more technical, um, given the graph, if you look at the eigenvectors of the Laplacian, uh, you can get the segmentation of the data. And for those of you who know, you know what I'm talking about. And if you don't know, it will be too technical to explain why this is true. OK, but um, let's apply this very simple idea to subspaces. Can, can we go ahead and do that? So let's just compute distances. So suppose that I wanted to say that this guy over here is very close to that guy over there. Right, the distance is actually very large. So if I use e to the minus the distance, the similarity is going to be very low. 
Conversely, uh, if I wanted to say, well, maybe here I have two points in different subspaces that are very close, so e to the minus of distance really just doesn't cut it. In fact, um, defining a distance is not possible just doing pairs, because suppose that I ask you the question, how many points do you need to define a line? You're going to say two, right? So how do you know whether, uh, whether two points are in a line? Well, they're always in a line, because <laughs> given any two points, they're always. So you need a, a minimum of three to be able to say, well, these three points are uh, collinear or not. So this idea of defining only pairwise similarities just doesn't make sense. In general, you need d plus 1 points uh, to, well, if there are linear subspaces, you need d plus 1. If they're affine, you need d plus 2. So you need many more points to define if they're. So this means that you cannot just look at similarities among pairs. You really need to look at similarities among many. But if you start looking at similarities among many, it's combinatorial. Because if I give you n points and I need to choose d, right, it's n choose d possibilities of similarities that I need to compute. And so that's exactly what motivated this very simple work uh, of, uh, he did it actually at the time he was here in uh, North Carolina. That's the polyface he was in computer science. Uh, so what he said was, ah, well, what I'm going to do is just take the point, take the k nearest neighbors of it. Compute a normal from the k nearest neighbors. Do that at every possible location, right? So if the two normals are very close, then uh, they're in the same subspace. If the two normals are very different, they're in different subspace. So that is actually a very good similarity. And that uses the fact that you use the dimension. Well, but you need to tell me the dimension beforehand. And I don't know it in general. So that's the first caveat. The second caveat is, well, what if I'm here near the intersection? Look at your k nearest neighbors. They could be in different groups. And the normals that I get can be completely contaminated. So that's a problem. The second method is the method that I already described. Let's actually look at similarities among all d plus 1 choices. Let's construct these multi-way uh, similarity and multi-way graphs. And that, as I already mentioned, computational complexity is where the issue is. So as it turns out, um, some of these challenges do occur in real data. So uh, what I'm showing here is what is the angle between two subspaces and this is, sorry, the x-axis is the angle between two subspaces. And the y-axis is the percentage of data points who, of, of subspaces that have an angle less than something for two databases. One is a motion segmentation database. The other one is a face database. So what this says is that for motion segmentation, most angles are between 0 and 5 degrees. So the subspaces are actually very close in angle. And for faces, is between 10 and 20. All right? So the real data is challenging. The, the angles are not, subspaces aren't orthogonal to each other, which would be an easier case to do. What about this idea of the nearest neighbors uh, that I talked about? You know, I said if you're near the intersection, you might get the wrong neighbors. You might say, yeah, but maybe there are no intersections in the real data, so why do you bother? So what I'm doing here is uh, the x-axis is the number of nearest neighbors that are in the wrong group. So if I look at 10 nearest neighbors, 70% of the data points are in the wrong group. That's for the case of faces. Okay, So faces that are very close to yours uh, in just Euclidean distance aren't good neighbors at all. For the motion segmentation, it's a little bit better. If I look at the 10 nearest neighbors, then just about 5% of the motion trajectories are in the correct group. So there are these two basic challenges that are important in real data. So figuring out things that don't rely on nearest neighbors and that are able to handle small angles are things that are needed. So as it turned out, we were able to construct a similarity, not just among D points, which was already combinatorial, but make it worse. Construct a similarity based on all the points, N of them. All right, and we were able to solve this issue of intersections, no problem, and figure out theorems that tell me for what angles these things work. And the basic idea is actually incredibly simple. All what we do is to uh, use uh, the following idea. Every data point 
can always be written as a linear combination of all the other data points. Why would that be true? Well, think about lines in the plane, right? Take any point, like this green point on the far right, is a point in R2. Can you write it as a linear combination of 100 other points in R2? Well, yes, always, I can do that. Is the solution unique? Well, no, because you see the dimension is only two. There are lots of ways in which I can construct that linear combination. In fact, there are only two linearly independent. Uh, so uh, there are lots of possible solutions. All right? What if I look for the sparsest solution? So uh, write that point as a linear combination of the entire data set, but do so with very few coefficients that are different from zero. So I ask, you, I ask you particularly, look at the picture for that point. What is the sparsest possible solution you can possibly get? Well, as it turns out, every green point is a scalar multiple of any other green point. So the sparsest possible is with one non-zero coefficient. All right? Just one. Moreover, the non-zero coefficient comes from the same group that the data point is in. So I can get the dimension of the subspace is 1. So the number of non-zero coefficients gives me the dimension. 2, the non-zero coefficients tell me which point it is in the same group that I'm in. And so I could actually now deal with subspaces of different dimensions. Now, the story isn't as nice as you might think, and I managed to fool you. Because now, let me look at this picture. Take the green point again, any of them, write it as a combination of all of them, the reds and the greens and the blues. Look for the sparse solution. What would the sparse solution be again? In this case, I just need two because every point in the plane can be written as a linear combination of any two other points. And the dimension is two, and the non-zero coefficients comes from the right group. So that's all right and nice. But uh, I don't know, I could have very bad luck. Like maybe this guy is also a linear combination of this guy and of that red and that blue. The sparsity level is still two. But it comes from different groups. I don't even get the right groups. It even, it even comes from two different groups. Right. So n naturally, the mathematical question is, when does this work? And what that do I mean by work? When is it the case that sparsity is the same thing as what I call, and this is my new definition here, subspace sparse? What do I mean by that? When is it the case that if I search for the sparse solution, the non-zero coefficients always come from the right group? Yes? Why, why are you moving to L1 instead of performing the L0 sparsity? Put it, putting aside the... I am the at this line of my talk right now. All right, so I, that's exactly what's coming next. So the first point that I'm going to ask is what are the theoretical conditions under which the sparse solution is such that the non-zero coefficients come from the right group? That's the first question. Now, in practice, uh, computing the L0 optimal solution is difficult. In general, it's a combinatorial problem. So we would like to do it using maybe simpler and, 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 and uh, I, in this particular case, a convex optimization, which is minimizing the L1. And I could just go ahead and do that and hope that things work. But theoretically, I want to ask the question, if I do L1 minimization and I look at the optimal L1 solution, is it the case that the non-zero coefficients that the L1 solution gives me come from the correct group as well? So I'm trying to answer both questions. So why L1? It's so far, it's because I'm lazy. But in, a, but in addition, I want to f find conditions under which my laziness is still correct. So here's the first <coughs> theorem. So the first <coughs> theorem says that if the subspaces are independent, then both things that I already said, both the L0 and the L1 solution are right. Okay. What does it mean that they are independent? It means that the dimension of the sum is equal to the sum of the dimensions. So in this picture, 
two lines of dimension one, so one plus one is equal to two, I've been told. What about three lines? It doesn't work because one plus one plus one is three and the dimension of the ambient space is two. Okay, so that's what independence means. So this joint is the case of three lines. And, and of course, I'm illustrating this with lines, but I'm speaking in this, uh, these things are general. So this joint means that the intersection of every pair is just the origin. So in this case, the theorem, and these are both sufficient conditions, by the way. They are not necessary. So the theorem says the following. Okay, there are lots of equations, so let me just try to explain it. Theta ij is the angle between subspace i and subspace j. All right, so what does this condition say? The cosine of the angle needs to be less than something. Forget about the rest of the equation. The cosine of the angle is less than something. What does that mean? That the angle needs to be bigger than something. So it makes a lot of very intuitive sense. What this says is that in order for the method to work, the angle between the subspaces needs to be sufficiently large, which makes a lot of sense because if the angle gets to be really, really tiny, eventually things are not going to work. Right? So that is this part. Okay? This of i is the dimension of the i subspace. So what about the other side? The other side is a little bit more complicated to explain, but let me just go through it with the basic intuition. Y sub i is the subset of the data that comes from the ith group. <laughs> what did I do? It <laughs> <laughs> wasn't real. So Y sub i is the subset of the data that comes from the ith group. Sigma di is the d sub i singular value. So think about data in a di dimensional subspace. The, sig the sigma di should be non-zero, right? What if the data is degenerate? If it lives in a subspace of dimension d minus 1, then that guy will be 0. So what this is saying is that the, this sub i singular value needs to be bigger than a threshold. So what this is saying intuitively is just says the data needs to be well spread out inside the subspace, needs to span the, the subspace. Right? And so the more degenerate the data gets, the harder it is for the condition to be satisfied. So the summary of it is that you can guarantee the correctness of the method as long as the subspaces are sufficiently separated and the data is well spread out inside the subspace. So that's what the conditions say. Right? And these are some just synth yes, sorry. So uh, could you say a little more on how we are defining the subspace angle? All right. Great question. So <coughs> um, If I was Jitendra Malik, as you said at lunch, I would just say, uh, if you go to MATLAB, you do help subspace, and that will give you the answer. <laughs> um, basically, when you have a, two lines, that's very easy, just the angle between the lines. But if you actually have uh, subspaces in general, what you do is that you compute, for example, an orthonormal basis for each one of them, and now you get two subspaces. And now you try to, then there are many possible angles that you can compute. And those are called principal angles. So the theorem here is about the smallest principal angle. So if you have subspaces of dimension n, then there are n possible principal angles that you can compute. And the basic idea is, is mostly like in PCA, right? You get vector 1 in subspace 1, vector 2 in subspace 2, take the dot product, maximize it. That's going to give you the, the largest subspace angle. Then you get the second one that are perpendicular to the previous one, and so on. All right. Any other question? Okay. All right. Um, let me just skip this. So um, everything I said so far, the theoretical correctness of the method, <coughs> is the data is perfect. There is no corruption of any kind, and I have all these theorems of correctness. So how can I handle? data that is corrupted. The first corruption is just add a small amount of noise to the data. So in that case, you know, the basic principle of the method is write every data point as a linear combination of all the other data points. So Y is here is the entire data matrix. Okay? Uh, so now instead of enforcing the constraint inequality, I'm just going to penalize the error with some uh, regularization parameter mu and minimize the L1 norm. What about data that is corrupted with missing entries? 
So what if this y sub i, which is now a very high dimensional vector, a few entries there are not there? And as a consequence, what if a few entries of the matrix y are also missing? So in that case, we're doing something very trivial, and we would like to improve this. Uh, but for now, all we're doing is just remove all the rows of the data. And uh, well, the data is y. So remove all the rows that you don't know that they are missing. And solve the linear system, if you wish, with the remaining. In some cases, that's a good idea. But you can easily think of cases where this will fail. Basically, what if once you remove the rows, then you remove everything? Then it doesn't work. What about outliers? Actually, that we can do very well. So the way we handle outliers is by saying, OK, the data point that is corrupted now is going to be a linear combination of all the others plus an error, as before. Okay. But the error now is not small. It's not Gaussian. Right. But what if the error is sparse? What do we mean by sparse? That if this is my data point, which is very long, then a few of the entries are contaminated but not all of them, only a small fraction. But for those that are contaminated, the error could be arbitrarily large. Okay? So this is what is called intrasample outliers. So in that case, the data point is written as a linear combination of all the other data points. C is sparse, as before, because I was looking for sparse solutions. right? But E is also sparse. So in a dictionary that contains not only the data, but also the columns of the identity, the coefficients as well as the outliers is jointly sparse. And so now I can apply identically the same technique, except that in addition to solving for the coefficients, I also solve for the outliers. All right? So to summarize, what is the entire method? Take the cloud of points that is given to you, build a graph where the nodes are the data points, and now connect pairs of points with these coefficients that I computed. So for every data point, write it as a linear combination of all the others, and find the sparse solution. Cij is the coefficient. When I express i as a linear combination of all the others, this is the coefficient with respect to the j point. And Cij need not be equal to Cji, so I symmetrize. Right? And that defines the weight that will connect pairs of points. This is one particular example. So here, uh, white means that there is zero similarity, and black means that there is high similarity. So for every row, I, typically there are only four non-zero coefficients. This is because this was data with four-dimensional subspaces. Right? OK, uh, let me now move to the applications and how this works in, in practice. So this is the motion segmentation example that I argued earlier. So uh, under some assumptions, and this is well known in computer vision, if you take a video, you extract a set of trajectories, you put the trajectories into a matrix, that matrix has rank four if there is only one object that's moving. So if I have now videos with several moving objects, there are many subspaces of dimension four, one per moving object. And so the problem of segmenting the video is equivalent to segmenting the point trajectories according to a union of subspaces of dimension four. So we collected a database of 155 different videos uh, that have two and or three different moving objects. Uh, and that is available online. And we compared a number of methods over the past several years. So what this first plot shows is what is the percentage of sequences that have an error of less than some percentage. By error, what do I mean? For every trajectory, did it come from the right group or not? Right. That's the percentage of error that I'm. So if the error was zero, I would be happy. So let me look at uh, any particular method uh, that I mentioned before. Um, so the algebraic method that I developed in my PhD, that's GPCA. All right. That's here nearly, not the worst one, but nearly at the bottom. Okay. Then the method based on just looking at k-nearest neighbors, that's called LSA. That's sort of here in the middle. Okay. A method based on expectation maximization, alternating between segmentation and motion estimation, that would be this one here. 
that's also kind of in the middle. All right? And the sparsity base method is the blue one, which is here at the top. Okay? How does this compare, let's say, to robust PCA and other you know, recent algorithms that are also uh, based on sparsity? Robust PCA is not applicable to this problem. Okay. Because robust PCA is designed for one subspace. And here I'm looking at multiple subspaces. So robust PCA is given a data matrix that is low rank and contaminated with outliers. How do I decompose it as the sum of a low rank plus an outlier? So it's just one subspace. And can you perform that type of, can, can your algorithm run on that type of problem? Uh, it becomes a special case of just when you have only one. Yes? Uh, may I ask uh, how do we get the trajectories for each, for each video sequences? Uh, that's, uh, these days is relatively standard computer vision technology. So, uh, so there is the Lucas Canade feature tracker that comes implemented in OpenCV. That's what we have used. Yeah, uh, these days you can get the sub pixel accuracy for, for videos that are reasonable, right? So if, if the, if the amount of motion is small relative to the, frame rate, then it works relatively well. Yes? What designs the dimension of the, the, uh, the subspaces? You just um, mentioned that in, in Yes. In this particular case, the data are the trajectories. What is the length of the trajectories? What is the dimension of the data? It's typically two times the number of frames of the video. In this database, there is variability, but maybe there are some video clips that are on 30 frames. There are some videos that are maybe 100 frames. So the, deme the original dimension of the data is, you know, between 100 and 1,000, perhaps, in that range. The dimension of the subspaces is four. Why is that? Ah, why is that? Sorry. Um, okay, maybe that was here. So if you only had one moving object and you look at the trajectory, there is this classical decomposition into what's called motion and shape. What is the motion? The motion is the rotation of the object, which has three columns for the matrix, and the translation, which is one additional column. So that's why this matrix has four columns. And the shape corresponds to the points in 3D space augmented with a one. So that's where the four comes from. Now, technically speaking, there are really affine subspaces of dimension three. What do you mean 3D space? You're, you're operating on images, right? Yes, but the, the intrinsic dimension is lower. It's the intrinsic dimension of the motion trajectories. Here I'm not operating on images. I'm operating in uh, point trajectories. I take the videos. Right. I do tracking first. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so what are the parameters? I'm, I'm actually uh, confused here. Okay. X, I, J, X, I, J yeah. in this matrix is... Um, the projection of point J onto uh, image frame I. So it's a two-dimensional point. That's your spatial, well, basically, that's your spatial point, right? One column of this matrix corresponds to one of these points okay. tracked through the entire video. Right. One row of this matrix corresponds to all of the coordinates of all the points in one frame. So a uh, uh, two by p sub matrix is all the coordinates of the of the points, yeah. and I have p points. All right. And so again, the rank four is three dimensions for rotation and one for translation. Right. This is sort of the average performance. Uh, and here we have decomposed the sequences into three different kinds. One kind is videos that are more in the lab, so it's the really checkerboard patterns taken with cameras so that we can really control the fact that the motions are really independent. Then there is videos of traffic, so you just go outside and there are cars moving. Those motions are a little bit degenerate uh, because cars tend to move in a plane. Uh, and so the dimension, instead of being four, it reduces by one. For planar motions, you get dimension three. And if you're moving in a straight line, it's dimension two, right? And the third category is articulated motions, 
uh, so of the human body, for instance. In that particular case, the motion of one limb is correlated with the motion of another limb. And so the subspaces intersect. The fact that there is correlation means that the intersection among pairs is not just the origin. Okay? So I expected the method to fail for the last case, because remember my theorem said that I want the motions to be independent and the subspaces to be disjoint. So these are the first two cases. Uh, but the last case, they're not disjoint. All right? Uh, also, this is full dimension 4, but here now there starts to be variability. Some are dimension 4, some dimension 3, some dimension 2. Uh, and here you see the numbers, right? Most methods were on the order of 4 or 5%, uh, and we got it to less than 1% in average. And for three moving objects, uh, it was some methods were 20%, some, most of them on the 10% range, and we got it down to 2.45. So the bottom line is that uh, these methods based on sparsity uh, sort of extend the classical uh, uh, sparsity results from one subspace to many. They extend it to cases where you don't know how many subspaces there are. You don't know their dimensions. And they're able to be fairly robust to noise, outliers, and things of the like. Uh, well, these are more numbers that sort of prove what I just said. What about faces? So this is now a database of um, uh, 38 different subjects. And from each one of them, there are 64 different pictures taken from the light in different locations. So uh, what the uh, y-axis here shows is what is the percentage of, uh, of error, the number of misclassified faces. And the x-axis here is how many subjects do I take. So what we did was to take the entire training set and now just take only two subjects at a time, or three subjects at a time, and then take many, many subsets of two, many subsets of three, and then do an average. That's what these numbers show. So what is the worst method? Uh, the worst method is this um, local method that I talked about before, the one based on nearest neighbors. And remember that I showed earlier that for faces, if I look at the 10 nearest neighbors, about 70% of the faces are in the wrong group. That's why this method in this particular case fails, because it is based on defining the similarity by just looking at k nearest neighbors. Um, the second method here is the one that I said that you just look at all similarities among d and it's combinatorial and complex. So that's this one here. Uh, the red one, I did not talk about that today, but you did ask me about robust PCA. Uh, so this is an extension of robust PCA to model unions of subspace. So it's based on low rank techniques rather than on sparse techniques. Um, and uh, the one here in blue is the one that based on sparsity. So basically it's about 2% error for two subjects to 11 for 10 subjects. All right. And this is how long it takes now. Uh, so the combinatorial method, that's the more costly. So this is number of seconds for each one of the subjects. So this is about, I don't know, maybe, well, this is a logarithmic scale. So we're talking about maybe 300 or 200 uh, seconds per phase. Uh, the green one is this local method that looks at k nearest neighbors. The blue one is ours, the sparse one. And this one uh, is the one based on low rank. So the low rank is, is faster than the sparse one. Right. Anyhow, um, I was going to talk about now about block sparsity, but that will probably take me a while to go through. Um, so maybe let me just give you the very basics of it. I'm going to skip most of the technicalities since I only have five more minutes. Are there any questions before? No? Okay. So block sparsity. Um, everything I said so far, it was unsupervised. I was just looking at give me data, you cluster it. So now I want to do classification. So you're going to give me a training set. And uh, now I have labels. So in particular, in the case of faces, I now want to not just cluster the data according to multiple faces, but I want to recognize every face. So 
in this particular case, the basic idea is that we're going to model the training set as a union of subspaces, where uh, one class corresponds to a different subspace. Okay. So there was this very nice method uh, that, in fact, has been incredibly successful, and uh, it's been only two or three years, and it has about a thousand citations already. It's a paper by uh, John Wright and Yima about using sparsity for classification and for facial recognition in particular. So what did they do? They said, and this idea was just the, one of the reasons for the success is one because it works relatively well, and the other one it's because it's just incredibly simple. What they said was, well, just take a face, write it as a linear combination of all the faces <coughs> in the training set. All right. Look for a sparse solution. In if we get very lucky, and in fact you do, um, the non-zero coefficients will correspond to training examples of the same subject, and that's the way I'm going to recognize. Okay, and so that's exactly what you do. You find the L1 a set of coefficients, so you write a phase of linear combination of all the others. You find a sparse solution, and then the way in which you classify is you compute how well is the phase reconstructed by only the faces from class 1, only from class 2, only from class n, and the one that gives you the best reconstruction, that's the class that you're assigned to. Um, but there are two problems. One, uh, they didn't tell us why this works. Why is this correct? There was no theorem saying that this would always be the case. Right? And the second one, that at least intuitively, one might think that well, if you just ask for a sparse solution, right? In this particular case, uh, you know, maybe I have a million training examples, uh, and maybe the sparsity is 100. So in this particular case, I could have, suppose that I had 100 training phases. I could get the sparsity 1 from class 1, 1 from class 2, 1 from class 3, 1 from class 100, and that would have a sparsity level of 100. But that's not what I want. What I really would like is all those 100, all the non-zero ones, to come just from one block, which is the block that corresponds to the class. So in fact, the idea of sparsity, at least from the classification perspective, doesn't necessarily make intuitive sense. And what you would like to do is to capture the idea that I would like to come from the smallest number of blocks, ideally just from one block. So that's exactly uh, what we have done. And many other people are working on, on related problems. And so we used this so-called mixed LQL1 norm that are, uh, you know, what I just said, count the number of non-zero blocks. Uh, and I probably have uh, the mathematics here. So what we're doing here is the same thing as before. Write a face as a linear combination of all the other faces. But instead of looking for a sparse solution, is look this, what it's doing is count the number of non-zero blocks. So you get the coefficients, you get the coefficients that are associated with the ith class, and if the norm is non-zero, you count it. Otherwise, you don't. Okay, and a, a convex relaxation of that is what is written here, which is the sum of Q, suppose that this is the two norms, so the sum of the two norms of the block coefficients is a relaxation of it. So, I don't have the time to explain you, uh, but the, what the paper is about is about deriving conditions under which the LQ1 solution, which is written here, gives you the same thing as the block sparse solution. Okay, so we generalize, if you're familiar with the literature, uh, look at restricted isometry, incoherence. We have generalizations of those to the block uh, case. And, and theoretical conditions. And interestingly enough, they're of the same flavor that I would already said before. The type of conditions are you want the blocks to, be, to have an angle that is sufficiently large, and you want the data to be well spread out inside the, sub the blocks. Those are the kinds of theoretical conditions that guarantee that this convex relaxation gives you the right block sparse solution. And uh, let me skip all of the theorems and, and the math and just show you um, that this works. Okay, here are a few examples. 
So this is the same uh, database as before. This red thing over here, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. This, this red one over here, which is this triangle here, is the uh, John Wright and Yima solution based only on L1. This x-axis is the number of training examples. So you use only nine, so the, bl the, the length of the block is nine here. You know, many face recognition methods work with at least 1,000 training examples per group. So here we're using nine. Okay. So Yima got 80%, uh, which is relatively good. So we can get at least a 10% improvement by using these mixed L1, L2 norms on that. Now, when the number of training examples grows, and this is 32, the gap is much smaller. So these, uh, these metrics really show an advantage in the cases where you have few training examples per class. Uh, of course, it works with uh, outliers. So here you just take a face and you just corrupt it. This is not a very natural corruption, uh, I confess. But that's the way they do the experiment. So we follow the same formatting for the experiments. So this is the traditional way of doing face recognition with PCA and nearest neighbors or independent components analysis and nearest neighbors. It deteriorates with the percentage of occlusion very quickly. And the sparsity methods are all here. And eventually, they break down nearly at 20% occlusion. Uh, and again, the L1 is the red one. And the mixed ones are the green and the blue that we have. And now with more realistic occlusions, here the occlusions are glasses and uh, scarves. And now with real things, um, things don't work as well. We're not in the 90th percent anymore. But uh, you can see that there's been a significant improvement. So um, well, these are the classical methods. In, you know, in some cases, they were only at 10 percent, right? Uh, the, the number of classes is, is 100, so this is almost like chance. Uh, and the sparsity methods were doing better, so improvement. So this is for sunglasses. This is for scarves. Uh, the reason the scarves has many more occlusions, so like about 40 percent. And so that's why you do better with sunglasses than you do with scarves. Um, and uh, so this is the mixed methods that are doing better than just using standard L1. Well, here, here not. But the, um, anyhow, the bottom line, the main idea I wanted to convey is that there are lots of problems in computer vision, machine learning, medical imaging, where you have high dimensional data that comes from many groups. And that techniques based on sparsity and block sparsity and rank minimization are becoming very successful at being able to do segmentation and clustering of these high dimensional data sets. Uh, and moreover, uh, you can actually, under some restrictive assumptions, and that we are working every day on relaxing them, prove why they work and under what conditions they are correct. And even though in data sets things are violated, uh, they seem to be working. In fact, uh, Emmanuel Candes has a recent paper on extending things that I talked about today to cases without liars and noise under way less restrictive assumptions that we have. Thank you so much for your attention. For the case where, uh, so you assume that you have this the disjoint subsets where they only intersect with the origin, but then when you have ar the articulated data, it violates that assumption, but the method still seems to work well. Yes. So do you have any intuition about why it still works well, or whether that's specific to the, that data set or other types of data sets that also violate that assumption? Would it still work? Um, I don't have an intuition. I think I would probably have a better intuition once I managed to read Emmanuel Kandes' paper that now doesn't require that. Um, so my, well, as I said, the conditions that we have derived are only sufficient conditions. So the way you derive those conditions is by looking at the optimization problem and having some inequalities. And the question is how tight those inequalities are. Uh, and getting tighter inequalities is sort of harder. So while I don't have any intuition, my personal feeling is that 
um, if you had, it, it's all about this relationship between how spread the data is within the subspace. So it's very possible that the data is sufficiently spread out within the subspace so that when you reconstruct a point as a linear combination of the others, even if there are intersections, you still prefer to, the, either data is sufficiently well spread out, right? Choosing a point that is very far is, is a good idea in the sense of giving you a small coefficient by which you weight. So that's as far as I get with, with the intuition. But I would prefer to give more solid ground to why it works. But unfortunately, I don't know. So what you're saying is Condes lifted these uh, restrictions? Yes, but the setting is different. So our setting is purely algebraic in the sense of uh, the theorems are exact. There is no probability. His setting is more in the statistical setting where, where you say that with overwhelming probability, the method works. Thank our speaker one more time. Um, he'll actually be available to talk to students if anybody's interested. We'll be in uh, 2095 uh, until 3 p.m.